<laughs> and then, of course, the best game of all time, though, uh, you know, Mushi is great. But if we were to go back to the Super Nintendo, obviously it's Final Fantasy VI. Chrono Trigger is so lame. Uh, Final Fantasy VI is way better. <laughs> That's still wrong. You're so wrong. Chrono Trigger is <laughs> the best. Um, Ibu, I think this is actually the first live interview with both uh, Jay and I, so. No it, way. Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> Okay. All right. Well, We're exclusive. <laughs> Let me uh make sure I'm all well, good. I'm all well, good. I'm not ready. All right. Welcome back to Algo HQ. <laughs> I am here with Chris Swenner and Jay McCarthy, the co-founders of Reach, which is a blockchain development company. Uh, welcome to the show, both of you. Oh, well, thanks so much for having me, Ebo. Yep. Howdy. Yeah. So I I've met you guys before. Um. Well, we actually have some history just for people who are watching this for the first time. And Chris and I do this Sunday call together, uh, you know, every Sunday, 1 p.m. Eastern time. We have like a bunch of Algorand people come together uh, and it started about four or five months ago, probably. And it's really like turned into something, you know, we've kind of become these personalities in a way. Um, and so we have a lot of uh, discourse in that. But this is the first time that we're getting to chat one on one. And then, Jay, I met you at Decipher. Um, in this, we did one of those Sunday calls, but it was live and you were there and that was pretty fun. And yeah, it's, it's a pleasure to have you both here. So thanks for coming on. My pleasure. And I, it was, it, I, when we first started, there was like, you know, four people listening. Now there's close to a hundred sometimes. Yeah, I know it's, it's pretty nuts. <laughs> um, so the, you guys have a bunch of different things you work on. First reach is a blockchain coding language which allows uh, a developer to connect to multiple blockchains and use um, preordained smart contracts to increase the security. Am I getting this right? Not really, um, but that's okay. Nice, <laughs> so nice. Me, uh, nice uh, right. do, um, correct me, correct me. All right, Jay, go for it. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Reach is a blockchain development platform that uh, drastically lowers the barrier to entry to blockchain. We make a much simpler way to program using a JavaScript based language. And we use a high level of abstraction when you write your program in the first place. In addition to that, when you run your program, when you compile your program with reach, we automatically formally verify it and check that certain security properties always hold for every reach program. Some of these are simple things that most people can understand, like not having uh, numbers overflow or not locking funds away forever, but others are more sophisticated. And you as, an, as a reach programmer can add whatever uh, additional constraints you want in your program. As you mentioned, it's blockchain agnostic. Mm -hmm. And one of our sort of marquee uh, backends that we compile to is Algorand because Algorand is extremely fast and efficient. And we you know, support other blockchains as well. So let me ask you. And Jay. it's not only a programming language; it's also the whole development platform. So when you use Reach, you get to have tools to test and deploy your code as well, rather than just programming it. So let me ask you, Jay. What's what kind of project is best for using Reach? Like, um, I kind of want to dig into like the 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 strengths and the weaknesses of Reach, uh, and what are the strengths? Like, let's go on that first. What kind of project was best suited to pick up Reach and and go with it? In my opinion, there's almost no project that you wouldn't want to use Reach for. So I kind of want to say that all of them. But if I were to, for, if you were to twist my arm and say, okay, well, you have to say which ones are it's best for. I would say that the two things that it's best for is it's best for a, a beginning programmer. So a beginning programmer, um, the low level design tools that are available on the platforms that we target are very difficult to use and difficult to learn how to master. So a beginner is especially well suited to get started using Reach because whatever project they want to do, we'll be able to handle and um, it'll be easier to do. So that's sort of one side. But then the other person that I would say or project that is really optimal for using Reach is one that is so complicated that using existing tools, you would have almost no way of getting it correct. As a concrete example, you know, when you, um, like every program that you're using right now, like we're in Zoom right now. So ultimately are the processors on our computers are running them, which means that ultimately machine code is in control of Zoom. 
Right. However, it is almost certainly the case that Zoom was not written directly in assembly because almost no programmers are written in assembly anymore because it's too complicated to do so. Mm -hmm. Basically, the only things that are written in assembly are very simple programs that control like a hardware device. Everything else is written in high level programming languages. And that's really because if you were to try to write a web browser or Zoom or something like that in assembly, you would never finish. Uh, because it's just so complicated to do. So reach is like that for blockchain. The existing tools are like assembly and reach is a high level language that anyone can use. Okay. So a uh, quick question. You two wrote reach yourselves, right? I mean, he wrote reach. I I'm the cheerleader. <laughs> so, and this is not, um, this is not a dig. How do I know that reach is legit? Like, I know it's legit from a, from a personal standpoint. I know people who yeah. use it, but let me just like, the question is if it, if you can guarantee me that reach is a more secure and, and more efficient way to build on blockchain and you built reach, it all comes down to you, doesn't it? So how yeah. can I, how can you, how can you guarantee me that reach is a better option? Yeah. So, um, I think that there's, uh, there's, there's three things that reach provides value with it makes it, it's easier it's faster and it's more secure. So for each one of those, there's a different way to evaluate our claim. So with the easiness, um, the, the simplest way of course is for you to try it and uh, decide for yourself whether it's easier than the alternatives. We can point to our community of 4,000 developers, actually I guess 4,500 now. 4,500. Uh, yeah, 4,500 developers who have uh, built using Reach. And we can, we can point to them and say, well, actually, you know, that is a, a number that is um, comparable or larger than some of the networks that we attach to. So that tells you that uh, lots of other people find it easy, but I think that the easiness is something that is easiest for you to evaluate on your own. Mm. Now, the next metric is the fastness. So when I, we say fast, oh, go ahead, Chris. I, I would say that uh, on top of the, the, you know, asking and seeing yourself is one thing, but I personally believe that looking at uh, lines of code total is a great way to look at it and say this is easier just because the more lines of code the harder it is to actually build things right and you know looking at for example humble that we're launching uh i, I actually haven't looked in a while but uh for for a long time the number of lines of code for the pool was under 300 lines of code compare compare that to writing it in straight teal um you're looking at thousands of lines of code mm. so be between the two right there that's like you know, obviously it's going to be easier to write less number of uh, lines of code. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, humble, for instance, uh, the program is about 350 lines, I believe, yeah. and it compiles to two different programs that are each about a little over 3000 lines of teal code. And so even if you, we were to imagine that reach was extremely inefficient and under optimized, let's say that it was twice as bulky as was necessary that still means that it's 10 times less uh, code to produce than you would have by hand. Mm. But the other dimension of fastness is not just ease of adoption and learning it, but the other way to think about fastness is the performance that the programs give um, and the performance that your developer gets. So though that lines of code is a nice way to think about the performance for the, for the developer, because um, if I enter the algorand world and I'm trying to build something, uh, and if I use directly the low level tools, I have to think about ideas like transaction groups. Is this gonna be a pay transaction or an AX for a transaction? And oh, do I have to make sure that I you know, have my users opt in to this application first? And should I do that by setting the on completion tag on this transaction or that one? There are mm -hmm. all of these low level details that a developer has to think about. And all of those are completely abstracted away. Okay. So that is, by raising the level of abstraction, that's in fact what makes it easier. Furthermore, there are optimizations that we can do on the program itself because we understand more about what the program does than something that is just looking at the assembly directly. So let me give you a really concrete example of that. So um, one of the things that you might want to do is you're gonna store inside of your program some global state that's used every single time. And that global state, you may have uh, at one point in the program, 10 variables. And at another program, another part of the program, eight variables, another part of the program, 11. 
Okay. And what reach is going to do is gonna look at all of those variables and figure out, okay, well, there's this common set of five that's always used. And then these other ones are different every time and it's gonna compress them all into the same space. So the amount of space that's used in the global state is the minimum necessary for running the whole program. Now, that would be something that you could do by hand, but it would be very difficult and dangerous to do so because it's very hard to keep track of in your head, like, oh, at this point in the program, this range of bytes means this, but in this other part, it means that other thing. It's very difficult to do that. And that's why um, sometimes when you look at websites like Algo Explorer and you explore what the, what the global state is for programs that were written by hand, they use an order of magnitude more space than reach. Mm. And this is relevant, of course, because you pay for space on networks like Algorand and Ethereum and whatnot. Okay. So we've just talked about the easiness, the fastness, and the last one is the security. And I think that this is probably the most important one. So we should spend more time on that. So the gold standard of security is something called a verified compiler. And what a verified compiler does is you provide a semantics for the programming language. Uh, what a, semant a semantics is just a fancy way of saying, what does the program mean? And then you also provide a semantics for the target language. That's the assembly. And basically what you do is you prove a theorem that says for all input programs, there exists an output program that means the same thing. And if you prove that theorem inside of a constructive logic, then the proof itself is the compiler. And my PhD dissertation was building one of those for the prototype of reach. This was what I did about uh, 15 years ago now. Mm. And uh, the ideas of reach have been germinating for this whole time. And so that right there is the gold standard. Uh, we don't do that yet. And the reason we don't do that yet is because uh, Reach is still developing. We're not really sure uh, what more features we should add. And it's very difficult to engineer those proofs. Uh, it is completely possible that there is a, an error in, in Reach. Um, but one of the things is that it's very difficult to write a compiler that does anything and is also wrong because uh, the compiler has to follow extremely regular rules for producing your program. It doesn't like have a, a unique path for, oh, well, this is what we do when we're compiling CompleSwap. And this is what we do when we're compiling Game Jam. And this is what we do when we're compiling, you know, this NFT. It has to do the same thing all of the time. Mm -hmm. So it tends to be the case that errors are typically pretty shallow, meaning that if you make a mistake in your compiler, like all programs are always wrong. Uh, but yeah, all right. So that's a kind of summary. Love that summary. Let me just ask though, how did you guys come together? I'm going to send this to Chris and how did you get into this world of computer science and blockchain and finance and all and STEM and like this whole world that we kind of operate in is a combination of so many different things. I'm kind of wondering about the, your backgrounds and like what brought you to this place to make this together. Yeah, so I, I started as a software engineer back in 2000. So uh, I've been in you know the industry for over two decades. Uh, I was stayed as a software engineer for about 10 years. And then I switched over to product and uh, executive suites and entrepreneurship. Um, and then you know started actually having uh, building companies. And those companies were, uh, some of those companies that were involved with were acquired. Not, ooh, I'm rich acquired, but people bought the companies. And um, in 2013, I received my first Bitcoin and I wasn't in love with Bitcoin at the, at the time. I thought it was neat and I think it had potential, but I was like, oh, this is a thing that exists. Um, then in about 2015, people started talking about the trustless computer uh, using the blockchain as a actual state machine itself. And that's where I got really passionate about it because I believe that the world in general is broken. I feel like there's way too much power at the top. And uh, I don't believe that blockchain is the silver bullet that will fix all of our, our pain points, but I do believe it's the only technology in, in my lifetime that has a chance to make things better. So since 2015, I really started thinking, well, how do I get into blockchain? Um, I was running a, I think it was a, a 25 person service company at the time. I kept asking uh, uh, the devs when they had some free time to build some prototypes out, like, hey, try to do this thing. So I get wrap my head around exactly how blockchain works. In 2017, early 2017, uh, a friend at the time came up to me and said, hey, I have an idea on how to scale blockchain. 
I thought, hey, scaling is a problem. Let's fix that. So I jumped in, uh, jumped in both feet into blockchain. I ended up uh, selling off all of my company and then uh, starting a scaling company in, in blockchain. R raised about uh, 800K for to build out a prototype. And I started going around and going to conferences and trying to say, get people to use the product. And I found out that I kept seeing the same faces over and over and over again. I, uh, and came to the realization is that I could sell to every single person that I've met and it wouldn't be enough to actually build a full company on. Mm. And even though I knew scaling is a problem, I didn't think it was today's problem because there weren't enough developers building in the space. So at that point, I realized the big, big main thing that needed to be solved was bringing more developers in the space. Because if there's only a few thousand and there's tens of millions in the world, and I believe in blockchain by so much and so passionate about it, why aren't there other people? Because I'm not an idiot, or I hope I'm not an idiot. Um, so why are, where is everybody else? And uh, the thing that I heard several times for uh, talking to those, the developers in the space and the ones that decided not, not to come to the space, there's three issues. Number one is that the it was too difficult to, to program. Number two, it wasn't wasn't safe. And number three, everything was pr proprietary. So that they had to actually choose what which technology they wanted to learn, and then they were stuck in that technology. Mm -hmm. So then what I did is I, I looked at other potential uh, industries that start out niche and then went to mainstream. Uh, sp specifically, I looked at the personal computer and the smartphone. Um, both of those uh, industries, there were niche solutions until all of a sudden, I mean, everybody has a computer, everybody has a smartphone now. So what made that change? Tell me. The answer is, it was actually a, a killer app, a killer app where the world said, hey, um, this makes my life infinitely better. I need this. But the problem is you can't actually predict what a killer app is at all. If you, if you could predict it, VCs would invest in one company. And that's it. They wouldn't invest in 10, hoping one to succeed. Right. So I decided to dig a little bit deeper. It's like, okay, well, if a killer app is what's needed, what was the thing that was the catalyst for the killer app? And in both instances, it was the exact same thing. It was developer accessibility. Microsoft built the operating system for uh, the DOS operating system with the basic program language for the personal computer in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, Apple built iOS with the Objective C in the mid 2000s. So I knew at that point, what we had to do is we had to build the Microsoft or the Apple of blockchain. So that's where uh, where Jay comes in. So Jay uh, will tell you probably a little bit about his uh, his background, but um, he's a you know world renowned com computer science researcher specializing in programming languages, uh, formal verification, and compilers. Mm. And uh, we tasked him with figuring out what the operating system for blockchain would actually look like. And then, uh, then it took uh, took us about a year. Uh, we started in September of 2019, and it took us about a year to be able to build out the MVP. And then in September of 2020, we released Reach, and uh, or the MVP of it. And since then, now we have 4,500 developers building on it, plus right. about a dozen of VC-backed uh, startups. So I'll let pass it to Jay to talk about his background. Yeah, so, uh, you know, Chris has given a background of the company. I'll just give you a quick background on me. So, uh, you know, I uh, started programming very young. Uh, thought it was awesome. My first computer was a Unix terminal uh, running Ultrix because uh, my, uh, my dad worked at Digital Equipment Corporation mm. and uh, learned how to program in C with the Ed Editor, which lets you write one line at a time. And I got really into C programming and... Um, then I, you know, went to university and, uh, studied computer science and math and economics. And then I did a PhD at Brown in computer science, um, where I specialized in, uh, building a programming language for writing cryptographic protocols, uh, that did, that had a, you know, verified compiler and did, you know, static analysis of the program. You said you were doing that 15 then, years ago. You said you were doing that yep, 15 yep. years ago. So there yeah, was so I did, um, really 15 years ago. So what were you doing? You know, how can you, my question might sound simple, but how can you build something for blockchain that's pre blockchain? Ah, uh, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I built it. I built something that allows you to write programs, uh, that were like, uh, that were sets of 
uh, communicating participants, just like how reach works. Like it really is just a prototype for reach. Uh, the thing though, is that when you compiled it, basically it was totally trustless uh, in that each program, uh, like each participant uh, ran on their own directly communicating with each other. Hmm. So it's essentially like um, what blockchain does is it provides a communication mechanism and uh, that automatically checks that messages come from the person that they're supposed to, that they're claimed to have come from. So it basically like um, centralizes the authentication mechanism. Um, and it has this uh, append only property where you write once and then things stay forever. Mm. So you can, uh, the thing is, is that um, you can, all, all of these block, all of these programs that we write with blockchain, like you could write them uh, in terms of the data that they're passing around without blockchain, the special thing that blockchain adds basically is the currency um, and the fact that there's a distributed computer executing the programs. Those are the two extra things. There's like the cryptocurrency and then there's the, the smart contract, but the actual programs and the way you have to think about them, like designing a, a, just a distributed system like that, that's really what my research was in before. And, uh, you know, from that, then I, you know, became a professor, a tenure, a tenure track professor at Brigham Young University, um, where I continue doing research in programming languages and verification. Um, I'm one of the managers um, of the Racket programming language, which is a, um, a Lisp-like language that, uh, you know, has a, an industry and web focus. It's kind of researchy. We do a lot in helping um, uh, and making it suitable for education. So I did a lot of work in computer science education. But anyways, um, so I did research in that area for a long time with lots of work on, you know, designing new languages, formal verification, etc. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, I had a reputation, you know, as a, an academic computer science researcher for doing this kind of work. And um, quite a few people, you know, came out and asked me to work on giving them advice about verification for their blockchain projects or giving them advice about how to make uh, blockchain systems. And that's how I really got into this world. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of funny. I essentially have been working in blockchain for 20 years, but I didn't know about it uh, until, you know, um, until four years ago or so. <laughs> so so what, one, of the, one of the really cool things I, I tell a lot of people, and I don't think a lot of people know that this is that um, blockchain wasn't really a technical innovation. It was a economic innovation. A lot of the stuff that goes into blockchain has been around forever. It's just a matter of how it was put together and the economic systems that make make it survive. That's that was the true innovation. Cool. So you guys, product wise, uh, you have a few things that you're working on that Chris alludes to often. But first, let's start with humble humble DeFi. Seems to be the um, first thing that you guys are going to come out with. You have a Dex on testnet right now. Uh, but what else do you want to build into Humble DeFi? Uh, because you actually changed your your branding from Humble Swap to Humble DeFi, so that that entails that there will be more products built in over time. But what are you guys thinking? Um, to, like, what do you want to add to the Humble Suite to to really upgrade it and bring it to the next level? It's a great question. Uh, there is a fun that you caught that. So we've always been Humble DeFi. But uh, when we were actually putting everything out, where the first product that we were releasing was Humble Swap. So, I mean, the, the Twitter was Humble Swap. So, uh, it wasn't actually a new thing that we switched back to Humble DeFi. It was just a, a more clarification of really what Humble really was. Uh, but to answer your question, yes, uh, 100%, the swap is very much this the first step. Uh, swap hopefully uh, be released at the end of this month or early, early next month on mainnet. And it's just a, a traditional AMM swap uh, with, with your traditional pairings of, of tokens. But soon after, uh, we want to add uh, limit orders and then also um, liquidity mining and eventually a, even a derivatives market on top of it. Mm. But what Humble is, is it's going to be a DAO. I mean, we're, I mean, it is a DAO, it's just we haven't launched the actual DAO piece of it yet. Right. With the idea that the DAO will help decide the direction of where we want to go. Because the whole point of Humble is that we want to make sure that the, the product is very human-centric, very usable, very value-centric. And we believe that, that it's important to actually combine multiple different pieces of DeFi 
into a solid workflow that allows for your traditional mom, grandma, aunt, uncle to, to get value out of this without understanding the underlying, you know, pieces of what DeFi really is. Mm -hmm. So how do you intend to market it to mom, grandma, auntie, and uncle? Um, you know, it's still coming into a, a DeFi space. It's still pretty complicated to, to really get the grasp on it. it you know, are you going to do things like simplify the terms? Are you going to abstract away a lot of layers to make it super easy? You know, what are your plans for really making it, um, mainstream accessible? The, the step one, which was, I think one of the easiest things, but yet I haven't seen it done yet is provide live chat and a help desk. So that uh, when somebody is about to do something and they want to, you know, they don't know what's about to happen, they can quick chat and have a conversation with a real person say, no, this is what's going to happen when you do these things. Mm. Um, so many people out there, so many other other DeFi suites or, um, or you know, just swaps or what have you, their, their mindset is like, we need to make this as simple as possible. But yet simplicity can actually cause com complexity, um, which it sounds weird, but it's very true. Like a swap is two boxes and a button, but because it's so simple, you don't really know what's happening. Yes. I can put two numbers in there or one number here and hit the swap and something happens. Mm. Um, and that's what the direction that everybody's going is like, make the actual interaction as simple as possible. And I know our hypothesis is like, yes, that is part of it, but having education around it and the holding hand is something that's very important. Mm. So you said that humble, uh, is going to be a Dow. You also have a different project called Monarch that's also a DAO-based project. Are these hand in hand or are they two different things? Yes, they're both DAOs, but they have one they have quite a bit different features. And because they have different goals in mind. Uh, the idea with Monarch DAO is that it's really leaning into the community aspect of NFTs and what it means to actually own an NFT and, and providing more utility around that. And with Humble. Uh, it's it's more about uh, you know governance and decision making and uh, specifics around just DeFi in general. So there are you know both both will have proposals, both will have voting, but Monarch will have a completely different voting vehicle and a you know it, it's really a more of a DAO of DAOs and uh, and so it's more of like a DAO platform. And this right here, so Humble is a DAO specific for uh, Humble itself. So is Monarch a DAO launchpad? type of thing yeah so the idea is that so uh, when you so uh, an analogy that i like to use yeah so saying something is a dow is like saying it's a company so you know bank of america is a company and the taco stand down the street is a company and disney is a company but you know that says something about them that they all you know have boards of directors and you know they have shareholders so they're so, so knowing something is a company tells you something about it but it doesn't tell you what the company is for. Right. So Humble Swap, it's DAO. You know, you can kind of think about it as it is a DAO that manages like a bank, you know, at a very high level of distraction. That's what something like, you know, Humble is. It's a it's a financial tools company. On the other hand, what Monarch is all about is as Chris said, it's about NFT communities. So, you know, I would say that uh, I don't know, a better analogy for what Monarch is trying to do might be something like marvel entertainment or something like that where if you think about marvel there are many many different universes inside of the marvel cinematic universe or sorry the marvel universe period you know there's a cinematic universe there's the guardians of the galaxy people you know there's all these different little groups yeah and they have a common way of communicating with one another there are people that are fans of the entire universe there are people who are fans of specific things and so each nft community is kind of like that and what mark is attempting to do is create a federation of NFT communities and provide value for all of them and make it easy for people to launch their own NFT communities. Okay. So right. when it comes to that, um, if you join a federation, if you join an alliance, you, you gain, but you have to give. So what do you have to give to be part of Monarch DAO? Uh, like so if you're, if you're launching a series, let's say. Yeah. So the, the part of it by, by launching a DAO on top of, the monarch DAO. What you're doing is you're agreeing to fit within the actual the structure of that universe. And part of that structure in that universe is that they're the NFVs, which is what we're. Thank you, by the way, Ibu, the one that came came up with that name. Uh, the NFV itself is an evolving NFT. 
So they have the ability to evolve up um, up in rank, and the higher the rank, the more voting power that you have. NFV and being NF non fungible vote, just to clarify. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and the cost to actually upgrade it from the different stages requires the overall monarch token, uh, which it doesn't actually um, all go back to the monarch overall monarch DAO. It does go to the DAO that you are uh, voting on, and that NFV has. A voting power bo both of over the the community DAO and the monarch DAO itself. Okay. So it's um it's a you're giving back um, to the overall universe, um, but you also have a voting power in that uh, overall universe that you increase by evolving your your NFV. Right. So so yeah so it's it's a federation but it's. It's a federation owned by the participants. So the, yes. the main thing I always I talk about is that if you are if you are investing in leveling in your NF, your NFV, it's not really a payment. It's an investment because what it is is that you are you are gaining more power with that vote you have by putting uh, by investing in to level it up. So okay, uh, so it's kind of like how it works. Jay, if I already uh, for example have launched my NFT series, it's already out. People are already buying it. It's on the secondary. Will I be able to transfer that into the structure of Monarch um, and add some organization to my NFT series? Because a lot of NFT series on Algorand right now, they launch, they have the PFPs, they have the cool art, but the tools right now are not available to easily make it into a DAO. So will that be a feature of Monarch where you can take an already established uh, ASA or already established series and fold it in? Or will you have to create a new thing? Jake, do you mind if I answer this one? All right. So we are actually already working with some of the top artists in the Algorand space to adopt this structure. Um, there's a there's a couple of different ways that somebody can do this. Number one, it's possible to uh, to build like a V3 uh, to say, hey, um, you know, our next version is the actual uh, um, voting DAO version. And you could you can whitelist your already holders that that already have it, or um, eventually what we could do we could even make the NFV itself an envelope that would require a deposit of the ASA that that currently exists. Uh, so the answer is yes overall, um, but for V1 we are planning with just working with the existing um, very popular artists already in the space to to build their own. Uh, individual communities um, with new art. And uh, can you drop some alpha on which series those will be? Not yet. Mm, okay. Didn't expect it. <laughs> um, what about Game Jam? I want to ask you about, guys about Game Jam. Chris, I want to give this one to you. Can you give the audience a quick overview of Game Jam before I, j I ask you some questions about it? No, for sure. So Game Jam... By the way, code name. Um, we we are in the process right now of a full rebranding. So, in, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to uh, relaunch with the full real name of, of it all. But Game Project, Jam for now, we'll Project talk about Game it. Jam. Project Game Jam. Uh, well, Game Jam is a entire gaming ecosystem. Notice, I did not say a blockchain gaming ecosystem. I truly mean gaming ecosystem that would rival something like Steam. Now, the idea is is that Everything is based or baked around the interoperable asset. Owning an asset in one game will allow you to have perks in a different game and be able to actually bring that, that asset to any game in the entire ecosystem. How this works is by lowering the level of abstraction down to what it means in the asset itself to pretty much just like a string and allowing the game itself to contextually display or use that, that asset how it wants. I'll give you an example. Uh, the first series that we put out will be Greek gods. And Zeus is one of the, the Greek gods that you'd be able to get. Zeus is a, I believe, an epic level, I think. I think it's an epic level uh, rarity. Epic in terms of what? Like, how, how far up the scale is that? Um, I think it's, a, it's second from the top. Legendary is the top currently. Okay. Um, and it will have a cool image like that you'll be able to, you know, show in your wallet or on your gallery or what have you. But if you bring this, bring that that NFT to a um, a first person shooter, that Zeus uh, that Zeus NFT could be a Zeus skin for your gun with lightning bolts and whatever, maybe a storm cloud above your head, whatever you want. want. Cool. Then you could take that same Zeus NFT to a fighting game, 
and it could give you access to the Zeus fighting character or even a, an electric fighting character not named Zeus. It's up to, completely up to the game to decide what it is. And then you could bring it to a card game and it could give you a, you know, either a, a new back for your cards or it could even give you a new set of uh, cards that are available. Okay. Completely up to the, the game to decide what it contextually means. And, but the key is that you have the ability to bring it from game to game. The the part where it's really different from many different uh, places is that it's not a cash grab. We're we're not making tons of money from selling these NFTs. All of the proceeds and all of the proceeds from the fees that are generated with the card go into a DAO treasury, which which invests in more games to use the uh, the uh, use the um, the system. Right. And which will make more and more games. And once again, in the in the mind, mind of the gamer, I am not only just buying an NFT, I'm investing in the future of the games that will be used with this NFT. Mm -hmm. And of course, we've, uh, we've built uh, many other economic systems out there that will allow for uh, lending and borrowing these assets and also a, um, a guild uh, DAO system that will allow for people to... Um, you know, the, the guild itself to own the assets, you can borrow it out of your guild treasury. And there will also be an XP play to earn aspect of it so that you can use and upgrade your, uh, your assets. So it's an entire, um, economic system. And, uh, lucky enough, we convinced uh, some of the, the, uh, ex, uh, blizzard employees to come in and run that project. And, uh, they're, they're doing a really great job. Uh, we've, we've now, I believe we have four or five LOIs from AAA and AA games signed on to use the system when it's actually launched. And um, I'm really, really bullish on it. Right. Um, Jay, do you want to weigh in on Game Jam or can I ask something? Yeah, so um, a good way to think about Game Jam is that uh, if Game Jam launched 30 years ago, then we would be Nintendo. And when you got DLC in one game, you would use that same DLC in other games. Mm. So that, you know, if you had your Link character, you would use it in Mario Party and in you know, Mario Kart, and you would have, you know, your, uh, your Link Amiibo, uh, sorry, your, you know, your, some, some way to use Link inside of, uh, I don't know, your Kirby game or whatever. Okay. There's an inter, there's an interconnected ecosystem right. of assets that go from game to game. So that when you buy your loot box in one thing, and you decide not to play it anymore. You haven't lost all of your resources. Mm. And it also makes it easier for new games to be created because they basically don't need to, it's not as risky to go try a new game because you know that all of your assets will work in that new game. And that makes it so that it's easier for people to create new ones. And thus it's really beneficial for the game developers because they have a built-in audience, uh, just like, you know, an existing, um, you know, uh, video game platform has. So question is games are a really, uh, intensive thing to build. Um, Chris, how are you, how are you getting developers to come and use this system? Because usually a game takes two, probably a minimum two years and up to four to five years to build. So yeah. it's a long-term play um, or at least mid long-term. So how are you finding these devs and selling them on this idea? And how do you intend to like expand the, the amount of developers and game uh, builders who will use this in the future? Well, the step step one was to make it so that they didn't need to learn blockchain. Uh, providing them an SDK in either Unity or the Unreal uh, system, what allows them just to install the the uh, the Game Jam SDK and be able to pull in pretty much an array of all of the assets that they would were would need. So they build the game no matter however they want, and all they have to do is actually just install it. And the really cool thing is because we've done it that way, um, and the the blockchain itself isn't an integral part of the actual game mechanics. And it's more about uh, recording and showing ownership of the assets. It is a more of a side uh, plugin rather than actually a core part of the game. So um, one of like one of the AAA games that we've um, signed on is a, you know, has been in development for, I think at least probably a couple of years already. Um, and we're, we're coming in after all of the assets are built and now they're just tying this in as, as more of like a, a replacement for a database. Mm. It definitely seems really cool, really uh, has potential to create um, a sticky user base of, of players who will, like Jay was saying, get tired of one game, but you still maintain the XP 
and the hours you put in, you can transfer that over to another game. Uh, I have a question for you guys. What games do you play? Like, what what are your favorites? Chris, you go first. All right, I'll go first. Uh, so I, I play the game of life at this point, uh, running four four companies. I'm I'm pretty much wake up and I work and I go to bed, um, and I wake up and work and go to bed. Um, but before I got nuts, I was really big into Overwatch. Uh, I played Overwatch quite a bit. Uh, it's actually the 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 reason why I came up with the idea of Game Jam is because of Overwatch. I've spent sadly probably you know at least a few hundred dollars, if not a thousand dollars, on loot boxes that I don't I don't have use for anymore. Like they don't right. mean anything. Right. And that that is the part that meant like, huh? Yeah, maybe I don't play anymore, but I probably will play a game eventually again. But probably not go back to Overwatch. So, um, but yeah, I, I played Overwatch quite a bit, but. Favorite game of all time is Chrono Trigger. Um, yep. I mean, Chrono Trigger is is the best game of all time. I don't care what you say, Jay. I I. <laughs> uh, but uh, I've been playing games my entire life. I I truly am a very deep gamer. Okay, love that, Jay. How about you, deep gamer. The games that I like um, the most are uh, Souls like games and okay. shmups. So, uh, you know, like I like the 2D Souls like games. Like I played Dead Cells for a really long time. I love that. Uh, and then I also really like, you know, normal Souls like, like, you know, even ones that are not by From, like Neo, I liked a lot. Um, and then shmups are really my favorite genre of game. What's a so shmup? My, uh, like a, like a, a two dimensional spaceship game where, you know, but they're also called like bullet hell shooters. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Maku, yeah. So my favorite game is called Mushihime Sama Futari. Uh, okay. I like the black label version. Dope. So that's my favorite game of all time, definitely. Um, I love, I know Bullet Hells. I never heard of that one. I, Dead Cells is a great game. Have you played Bloodborne? Uh, yeah, Bloodborne is pretty good. Yeah, I like Bloodborne a lot. That's a great game. Um, <laughs> and then, of course, the best game of all time, though, uh, you know, Mushi is great. But if we were to go back to the Super Nintendo, obviously it's Final Fantasy VI. Chrono Trigger is so lame. Uh, Final Fantasy VI is way better. <laughs> That's so wrong. You're so wrong. Chrono Trigger is <laughs> the best. If you're looking for a cool a cool game that's uh, randomly generated and very difficult, uh, check out Rain World. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, it's super, Rain super World. cool. You play a, a slug cat, and um, you have to survive for seven days. And after a certain period of time, as you go, it's 2D, you go around, and then like you live in this world where the rain will kill you if, you, if you're like, in it. So that, I'll just leave it super, super cool. Um, you, you probably would like it. <laughs> Uh, so ETH Denver's coming up next week. Uh, you, you, you guys are both going to be there, right? Yep. All right. So what are you planning for ETH Denver? If you can maybe drop some hints. Do you want so, to I mean, sure. You want some alpha? I'll give you some alpha. I, I've been actually, I've been subtly hinting it. Uh, we plan on announcing Monarch. So Shanti is going to be uh, given a presentation or be on a panel about it. Um, hopefully, knock on wood, we'll be able to have the white paper done. At the very least, we'll have the the website done for it. Um, so that's some alpha. Uh, I think we're going to be announced, or, or we might be showing off the new blockchain simulator. Maybe it's like uh, the thing that I always say is that the blockchain simulator is a super nerdy way of saying a, a blockchain debug, de debugging tool, but it's it's more than just that. Because what it does is it, is it allows you to simulate how your entire application will work and allows you to go back and forth uh, be, like between the different states of your application and be able to even modify the, the state on each, each uh, node and even jump different branches on the trees and do it all in a visual way. This is a game changer when it comes to uh, blockchain de uh, blockchain debugging and i don't i don't mean a game changer on on algorand i mean period there's not a a blockchain debugger in all of blockchains uh so uh we're gonna be uh, probably showing off that a little bit nice um yeah. Jay, you want to talk about that a little bit yeah so it's an example of what's called the time traveling debugger so uh just to define some terms normally you know when you're programming you know you'll have your program and then you'll run a test and then running the test is a particular sequence of input to your program so if we think of a program like HumbleSwap, that means that like, okay, let's make a pool, then I'll do a trade, then you'll do a trade, and then we'll add more liquidity and then we'll do another trade. So that's like a sequence of actions. And what you normally do is you have your program and you have a whole bunch of tests. And 
you know, for each one, you make sure that it does the correct thing. The thing though, is that when you, that's fine for when you're done with your program and you are ready to, you know, get ready to deploy it. But when you're in the middle of developing your program, it can be really hard to even know what your program is supposed to be doing or how, what would be, what would a good test be? So the way that the blockchain simulator works is that you give it your program and then you can interactively decide, okay, well, right now in this program, there are 10 things that I could do. Let's pick the seventh one and do that. Then let's do something else. And you basically are exploring this tree of all of the possibilities of what you could do. Mm. And at any point you can go back and choose a different path and then compare back and forth the two different ones. So what we do is we, we display this graph on the screen, this tree of all the different possibilities. And at any point you can jump to an earlier point and try something different or go back to what you've done before. Mm. And it helps you gain an intuitive understanding about what your program means by exploring what its behavior is in a way that's like totally free form. And the thing is that if you didn't have the debugger, it would not be possible to do this. What you would have to do is you'd have to make like even something as simple as go down this path and then go down that path. Those would be two totally different tests. And you would have to have some way of like stopping them in the middle to compare what the results would be. And when we're talking about a blockchain, that means that you would have to have like multiple different developer networks running on your computer at the same time. You would have to have a way of creating something like, you know, an algo explorer style uh, visualizer of all the different nodes, uh, like all the different blocks on the chain to compare what happened. Mm -hmm. So what the blockchain simulator does is it abstracts all of those details away so you can interactively explore your program with this time traveling debugging mechanism. Right. That sounds super useful. I mean, you can dig into the weeds there. Um, I guess this sounds like it could empower more complicated apps to be built because, uh, you know, what's the, what's the big, yeah, it goes back to what we were saying before right. with yeah. everything that reach does, it lowers the barrier to entry and it raises the ceiling of what is possible. Mm. And though every time we make the platform stronger and more capable of doing things, it does both of those. It makes it so that new people can get in. Because there are some people who they can write a program, but maybe they don't have an intuitive grasp of what, what it means. The simulator helps them gain that intuitive understanding. Other people who already have expertise, but they, you know, it's like, maybe you're really smart and you can think of 10 ideas at a time, but this program is so complicated and you need to be able to think about 13. So no matter what you are trying to build, there's always something that is a little bit beyond that. And when we make the tools better, we make it more possible for people to make more interesting and complicated programs. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Last question. Companies building on reach. What are some of the ones that you guys want to highlight, bring some attention to um, different teams using reach in different ways? You know, which companies, I'm sure you, you love all the ones that are building, but which, which excites you the most? Um, like as we go into 2022, uh, which ones have, have the biggest blow up potential? Uh, wow. What's the biggest blow up potential? I mean, x -Bact, obviously, they're doing amazing things. Uh, I think that they're, the team is very solid. They're using reach. We're communicating with them uh, almost daily. Uh, so we're very bullish on them. Uh, Algo Mint, uh, their V2 will be written in reach. Uh, so, you know, obviously, we're really bullish on bridges because we need to get more uh, more tokens over. Um, uh, tiny chart, uh, they are actually starting to build, uh, like, you know, they started off with an analytics tool, but now they're going to be building a lot more functionality on chain functionality and they're using a reach and, uh, we love what they're doing. Mm. Um, Dequency, uh, they're, they're building with reach and I think that it's going to be very big and, you know, I, I, I'm going to let them actually drip their own alpha, but they have some really, really awesome fun things that they're, that they have planned with, with NFTs and, um, you know, zone, uh, we, I don't speak much to zone themselves, but I do know that zone is, is using, uh, using reach, uh, zone Jay, can you, yeah. uh, yeah. Can you, can you think of any of them? I'm, I'm sure I'm forgetting a lot. Um, I think that, you know, we've given a big list and I think that many people, they may be interested in hearing directly from the developers. Right. And we recently posted an interview with one of the core contributors at expect, and he can talk about his experience using reach. So this is uh, linked on our Twitter and our YouTube. It's an interview with Austin Wilshire of x -Bact. I highly encourage people to go check that out. Yeah, that's a, that's a great one. But yeah, I mean, there's there's several. Like I said, there's there's probably at least a, a dozen VC-backed companies building on Reach at this point. Uh, and the, the, the fun part is like we've 
I mean, we've had a prototype now or a, an MVP for a little over a year, but let's be honest, it's been about three months, maybe four months before like that we've had enough features that can build like legit applications. Um, and we've already have about a dozen of uh, VC back startups. I believe that before then this year, we'll be closer to a hundred. Is Reach going to become a VC of, of your own? Um, probably. I think that's, uh, I mean, ideally that uh, we will, we are building up a treasury of tokens. Um, there we'll, we do have treasury management and, um, you know, things, and eventually we'll be, we'll be, uh, investing in, in companies for sure. Right. Yeah. That'll be exciting. Um, now nah, it's just been great. I mean, you guys are so full of knowledge, so amazing to learn from you guys. Um, I guess eat Denver, if you're watching this, I'll probably drop this like, uh, in the, in the days leading up to it. So keep an eye out for anything that's coming out. Um, Breach, if you're a developer, if you watch this video through to the end, thank you. Uh, you should go check out their platform. Um, uh, do docs.reach.sh if you want to go and um, check it out, the, the code yourself. You can, if you're a traditional developer and you're ready to build, um, oh, you know what? We should definitely talk about, I'm, I'm Brandon's going to get mad if we wouldn't say this already, is that um, Reach Summit is in March, which is a developer conference that kicks off a six week uh, hands on boot camp. So if you if you're a developer and you want to get in the space, that is the best time to get so. And then the, the so the conference we're inviting um, all of our partners. Uh, it's good, the Algorand community is going to be there in pretty strong force. And uh, like I said, it's going to kick off a six week boot camp uh, for the developers. To and I think between 100 and 150 developers we're going to send through the program. Mm. So that as well. What about for people who aren't developers but want to get into this space, get into um, blockchain, uh, interact with Reach in some way? What do you think is a good is a good way for them to get involved if they have zero coding experience? If they have zero coding experience, you're part of the community. You're you're there. You're helping. You're you're help spreading the word. Uh, one of the things I'll say on pretty much every one of these these calls or you know in, in the Twitter spaces is that we don't exist without the community. Uh, we, we might think that they, our product is the best product in the entire world. We do, we do think it's the best, but if other people didn't believe it, if other people didn't use it, it wouldn't be worth anything. So if you are not a developer and you want to get in the space, you know, reach out to us on discord, sit let us know what you're good at. I mean, we have a 45 person team at this point and only maybe, uh, half to two thirds are developers. The rest of them are community managers, uh, people actually had his community marketing, uh, biz dev, like we, we are hiring everybody in all different types. So not only are we hiring a lot of people, but you can be part of the community. And I'm going to tell you a little, little alpha here. we love hiring out of our community. So, uh, if you wouldn't want to be part of it, you know, start participating and you'll be at the top of the list when it comes to hiring people. This, this, uh, clip is going on Twitter just to, <laughs> just to advertise you guys. Perfect. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you both so much for coming on the show. Uh, it's been great to talk to you. Can't wait to hang out with you in Denver next week. Uh, are you guys, fun. you guys going um, skiing? I am. Yeah. Nice. Are you a skier, Jay? Uh, I have only ever skied in New England on uh, you know icy rocks. Mm -hmm. So I don't know how I what would happen if I snow, if I skied in real snow. It's so uh, no plans to ski this time. It's, uh, okay, okay, okay. Are you, a, are you a skier or a snowboarder, Chris? I ski. I'm, I'm a skier. skier. I'm a snowboarder. Yeah. Did, did you watch the half pipe last night? No, but I want to. I think snowboarding is awesome. It's just that uh, I started skiing before snowboarding was a thing. So. Oh, where, uh, <laughs> where I, I was at least. You can't be that old. There's no way. You're not. I think you'd, you're be, not I think you'd be surprised. I remember you don't look like you're in your snowboard for late the first 60s. time like, when I was. Uh... <laughs> I will say at least from where I ski, it, like there was like a couple of weirdos that had a board every once in a while, but uh, for the most part, it was a skiing. Right. Okay. Yeah, totally. Like I remember at the at the places that I went to when I was young, uh, they you they didn't even allow snowboarding. Like I remember when I was in high school, there was this big thing. Oh, now they finally allow yeah, snowboarding. Same. They hate us because they ain't us. That's right. All right. Well, I really appreciate everything you do. Yeah. Uh, thanks, guys, for coming on. See you soon. Um, I'm going to stop the recording real quick.